Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Torah, continuing our walk through Vayira. This is day number four. Let's go over to chapter number 20, as we've already discussed some of the things that took place in, with Lot and his family in chapter 19 yesterday. And we find these words, and Avraham set out from there to the land of the south. Why is he moving? Where he has been living has been a place of revelation. It's the plains of Mamre. It's the Terebinth tree. He has um, encountered the Most High here. It's been a good place for him. It's a significant place of circumcision. A lot of life events have taken place at this location, and he's moving. Why is he moving? I can think of at least maybe two reasons. One is that uh, the rabbis teach that Abraham and Sarah liked to show hospitality and so that they would set themselves up at a crossroads, a trade route, so that passers-by would want to stop in, eat something, rest a while, and they would have opportunity to share the news of the one true Elohim, yud heh vav -Heh. With the cities of the plain being at least within some close proximity, he had gone out when the, the smoke of the cities was rising up and he could see the smoke and knew that judgment had come. So he was within some short visible distance of the cities. Having been destroyed to the degree that they were, it's very likely that nobody wanted to travel that way anymore. So his opportunities to show hospitality very likely had been greatly diminished. Judgment had come. Maybe also, point number two, Lot and his situation. Um, Lot had found himself begging to, to escape to a city called Soar. And by the way, that, that city, its name means insignificance. Remember, uh, as we discussed uh, last week with Lech Lecha, that those who cursed Abraham would be rendered insignificant. Evidently, Lot had not kept his, his words um, precise and upfront about Abraham. Maybe he had uh, spoken ill of his uncle and was brought to a place of insignificance. Just a thought. Nonetheless, he's afraid to stay in the city after the judgment has fallen. He and his daughters escape to a cave. The unmentionable things that we don't want to talk about took place he now has two sons who are his grandsons. That such notoriety and, and um, ill repute, maybe Abraham just says, it's better if we put some distance between ourselves. I really don't want to be connected with all of that. So they head out to a place called Gerar, or Gerar, and they... Um, they find themselves uh, among a people that he says, I fear that the fear of Elohim was not here. It doesn't say that they were an unrighteous people or that they were an evil people. But for whatever reason, he did not believe that the fear of Elohim was there. Now, why would that be the case? Well, as we talked yesterday, those that are righteous are those that will be apt to give uh, Sadaka Umishpat righteousness, right ruling, uh, justice, and it's shown in the acts of hospitality and caring for those that are in need. Maybe when he, Sarah, and their entourage of servants and possessions, herds, all showed up, the people said, ah, they got enough, don't worry about them. So maybe for the lack of hospitality, he just discerned, yeah, it's not in this place. No one's asked me where I can uh, would, uh, want to store my sheep or my herds. No one's offered me uh, a drink of water. He's just not in this place. The ruler of Vimelech. Now, Vimelech is not necessarily a name, but rather a title similar to that of Pharaoh. Vimelech, the king, he spies a 90-year-old woman named Sarah and thinks, Wow, I, I have to have her. He inquires, and Abraham says, it's my sister. Now, we've talked about this before briefly. 
How do you think it made her feel to be identified as his sister and not his bride? Both would be related to him. Both would be family to him. But obviously there's a great dis difference of him and rightly reason. Well, if it's his sister, it's not his wife. And he sent and took her. Now, Yahweh says, I kept you from sinning. I prevented you from, from crossing a line here. And he struck the house with some sense of physical malady, causing them all great suffering. And when Avimelech cried out, you know, what's going on here? Yah says, this woman is not his sister, it's his wife. I've kept you from touching her. You return her to him and he will pray for you for he is a prophet. A prophet. Here, Abraham is not only a Siddiq, he is a prophet. And he says, when he prays for you, I will let you live. I'll heal you and your house. This tells me a couple of things. One, if we're going to identify ourselves with being in the body of Messiah, we need to do so significantly. Do not relegate yourself to the small portion. Well, I'm just, I'm just a sibling. I'm just an insignificant person. No, you're the bride. You are the bride of Messiah. He's called you to significance. He's called you to a lofty place. And unlike Abraham, he is not going to misname you. He's not going to incorrectly represent you to those that would desire you. And he will protect you. Number two, what this also tells me is that even the, those who walk in covenant with Yah are not always making the best and most wise of decisions. We all are yet human. Maybe there was an idea, well, you know, Yah's going to do what he's going to do. So what I do, it really doesn't matter. He's given to me this promise. I'm going to have a child, a son by her. His name is going to be Yitzhak, and it's going to happen in a year. It could be at this point, this point she's already pregnant with Yitzhak. Maybe she's not showing yet. Abraham could have said, you know, well, I have this promise. I have this prophetic word. Yah said it's going to happen. And so doesn't matter what I do, how I operate. It's going to come to pass. The promises of Yah depend upon us and our walk of obedience. This is not some uh, easy place, comfortable place where we can just assume in our walk. We must walk uprightly and be filled with integrity. And we should make our choices based upon the promises that Yah has made to us. If he says that this is what he's going to do, then I need to protect my wife because she is a vessel of honor and she's to bring forth a prophetic son, a son of significance, a son in whose name the covenant is going to be called. I need to protect her integrity. I need to protect her reputation. Give her security. Abraham didn't do that. But here's the other thought on the other side of that coin. Even though he failed to name her as the bride, Yah did not write Abraham off. Matter of fact, he told Avimelech, you get this man to pray for you. He is a prophet. And based on his prayers, I will heal you. Now, why didn't Yah just say, you're healed? Because the affairs of the earth, he is placed in the hands of man. He is looking for you and I to seize our opportunities to be significantly, significantly involved in what it is that he is doing. He does not act arbitrarily in spite of us or against us or without us. He is looking to use us. If you have failed and failed terribly, if you have not gotten it right, if you've not protected the bride or seen yourself significantly as a part of the bride, you've not been written off. Yah can still use you. You're still a part of the plan and the children of the covenant are still going to be produced even through you and me. 
Until tomorrow, Shalom.